Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the QT2 Systems Podcast Series, The Coaches of QT2. My name is Reem Jishi, and I'm the Content Director with QT2, and our featured guest today is Coach Vinny Johnson. Welcome, Vinny. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for joining us today. So um, I'm going to start with you like I always start, which tell me when you first came to QT2 as an athlete and then as a coach. Yeah. Um, probably in 09. So it was a year after my first Ironman. Um, I started to uh, work with QT2. Um, and probably about, let's see, 09. So it would have been 2015, 14, um, transitioned into one-on-one coaching as a coach. <clears throat> okay. All right. So we were talking a little before we got recorded today and It's always interesting to me how people come to triathlon. And so you came from an athletic background. Can you talk to me a little bit about where you're just walk, walk me through your athletic history and how you got into triathlon? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, So I kind of grew up, you know, quintessential, you know, three sport or, you know, baseball, t-ball. And then in high school um, started to swim and just really loved it. And, um, early on, I, I kind of felt this as workouts went longer, I was better compared to everyone else. I was able to hang in there longer and longer and longer and almost wish, you know, workouts or practices were an hour longer, you know? So I kind of knew that there was something about me that was just, I could just kind of go, 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 go. And then, um, was able to swim in college and I had my first practice in college and we had to run a mile for time. And then we had to swim a mile for time and we ran a mile for time. And I think I pretty much lapped everyone. I was kind of surprised. I'd never really had run before. And then we got into the pool and I got lapped by everyone. Um, so it was kind of a head scratchy moment where I was like, I was probably in the wrong sport. Um, but just love the, um, I love swimming. It, it, it's underwater. It's kind of isolating and it's quiet uh, there's something, uh, predictable about it. <laughs> um, so that was comforting for me. And so I just stuck with it. Um, I always lifeguarded growing up and we always had to go to a certain triathlon in our community back in Connecticut where we had to provide uh, safety. So I was exposed to triathlon early on, kind of in the early nineties and, uh, was always intrigued by it. And so when I would go home, after freshman year, or when I went home after freshman year, I did my first triathlon. So that would have been 94. And I kind of, I loved it. It was just that idea of cross training, something different, um, keeping uh, consistency, consistency throughout the year, even though I was swimming about nine months out of the year, it was like that three month window in the summer when you're not in college, it just helped me to kind of keep going and moving. Um, so did that and then um yeah I, I clearly remember my first race my last race in college and touching the wall and thinking that's over you know I'll never be competitive again I'll never kind of be in competitive sports kind of in that idea of you know just the amount of time and effort that went into what I had done over four years I, I would never be able to replicate again just because life moves on and you do different things and th- different things happen um, and you kind of just, uh, are left out to pasture and kind of ride out the rest of your life and do, um, quintessential normal things. And that, that happened for a handful of years. And then, uh, my swim coach in high school was a very impactful person in my life, uh, passed away and kind of just as a whim, as a memory, the next day I woke up early, I went to the pool five 30 in the morning. Like I did, you know, every single morning for eight years of my life, and just kind of as a memory and memorial to him, I jumped in and swam a couple laps. And that just kind of kickstarted almost the next, you know, the morning after that morning, uh, kind of did the same thing. And then I started to kind of run up and down a driveway a couple of times because I was actually, I think, I mean, when I was racing, I was like 150 and I was like over 200 pounds at that point. Um, so I wasn't really moving too much. So I was going up and down a driveway, I started riding my bike around the block and um everything just started to kind of stretch out a little bit more and more and more and more 
Mm -hmm. And I signed up for a challenge. So we had this local half Ironman, um, Moose Man. And I signed up for that. And I was just like all about breaking six hours and um, kind of worked hard to kind of do that, accomplish that barely. So I went like 558 and I was super pumped about that. Um, but I do remember coming out of the bike, I'm sorry, out of the swim, which I usually did kind of in the lead or in the front just because it, it was a natural technique for me. And then just, I just remember QT2 athletes, like just, you know, screaming by me. And that was a moment where I kind of took notice of, of that group of athletes and that they were doing something um, different. And then uh, I did that. So yeah, the half Ironman and then um, kind of figured out after that that I just wanted to become, you know, more and more serious about it. So, <clears throat> so about, do you remember about what year that your first half Ironman was? Uh, first time that would have been like, Oh, four. Okay. Yep. And then the early QT2. Ironman. <laughs> I said, so you saw some of the early QT2 athletes. <laughs> yeah. I don't even think it was almost. Um, I just remember the names, you know, kind of when you first start, you're always just looking at the top 10 list. Sure. And, you know, you just start to see, um, I mean, like Brian Hughes, I think was doing triathlons big time back then. And, you know, Tim Snow and John Spinney and Jesse, um, Caitlin, S Kate Snow. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's going way back. Pat Wheeler. So yeah. Yeah. Lots of familiar names. So, all right. So 2004, and you, you said it was a challenge. Was that, tell me, tell me about that. How you decided, was it a personal challenge or did it? Yeah. Yeah. It was just one of these, you know, kind of almost unachievable goals. And um, you kind of need that sometimes just to kind of keep yourself motivated. Um, and so I, I, I yeah, I, I kind of did that. And then, um, so I did my half Ironman. I was like, Hey, that's pretty cool. I'll, I'll think about doing something else. And um, over the summer at school, I, I teach high school, we had to read Outliers. And Outliers is a book about um, people that are really amazing at what they do. And the reason why they're amazing is because they were consistent over long periods of time. So they actually were exposed to certain opportunities, and but yet they had a huge bank of hours of exposure. And that's why they're masterful at what they did and, and do. And so, you know, like an amazing cellist, like they're amazing because they, they put in 10,000 hours plus of just doing that. And so, so that concept kind of struck a chord with me because I always, I was never, I, I never won anything. I, I was, I was, the, I was the kid that showed up and just did the work. Um, and people admired me for that, but I was never winning anything or like doing it. I was just kind of doing the grunt work. And, you know, personally, it, what the way it looks like, oh yeah, he's, you know, doing the work, but in my brain, I'm like I'm doing the work, but I'm not kind of getting any benefit from, or, you know, that feeling of like doing well and like competition and winning I never, that never really occurred for me. And I always had a head scratch you know, I was always scratching my head about that because I didn't understand it because I was putting in the work. And I just, after that book, I just realized I just had to consistently put the work in. And I had to change my athletic future because I could never change my athletic past. And we all have a certain history and the way we perform right now is based on that history. And a year from now, I can change my athletic history by what I do over the course of a year. And so I just took a big macro view of saying, all right, I'm going to actually put this like outlier type of idea to a test because I know I'm super patient. I know I don't need like immediate impact or immediate types of uh, stimuli to make me feel good. Instead, I know that, all right, I'm going to prove this kind of theory right or wrong. And yeah. so I kind of started that process. And so what, 08 would have been um, my first Ironman and my last Ironman was 2014 and I won. And so I barely broke 13 hours on my first Ironman. 
and I went 824 on my last Ironman. Wow. All right. That, that is not awesome. not the post or anything, but I was just like, there's, there was wow. nothing, <laughs> that is, nothing other that is, than I was kind of like, I just did it over and over and over and over again for eight years. That's the yeah. only thing. <clears throat> well, and you look, and I mean, you clearly paid attention to what you were doing and we're learning from it. And not, yeah, yeah. yeah. All the time. So, all right. So tell me, what was your first Iron Man? So Iron Man. Yeah, it was Ironman Louisville. I think it was the second time they ran that. Um, so yeah, it was it was the Ironman Louisville. Uh, uh, just hot and humid end of August. Just you know, absolutely brutal. All right. So you said that race, you broke thirteen hours. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. So 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 tell me about the race. Swim was good, right? Yeah, That's a easy, yeah. easy bike. Easy swim bike was fine you know up until mile 80 i was just eating mashed potatoes that were salted i was eating some sort of you know concoction cytomax max or something like that you know having some i think i had honey like pure honey so i was just doing mashed potatoes honey and uh some sort of sports drink that i really had no idea what was in it i think it was mostly protein it was probably a protein drink it wasn't even probably had any carbs and so I thought it was the easiest thing in the world. What's the big deal? Kind of hit mile 80. I was like, well, oh, that kind of feels a little weird. Um, kind of started slowing down. But that course back in the day, it, would, it was all downhill into uh, T2. So even though I felt kind of bad at mile 80, from mile 80 to 112, it's pretty much uh, downhill. So I didn't really kind of know what was going on. And so I got rolling and running um kind of you know a couple miles into the run your legs start to come back and you feel pretty good coming off the bike um and again kind of thought like what is the big deal like everyone's talking about Ironman being hard and then um probably like four and a half miles in um you know it just everything came unraveled I just couldn't even function so um so I walked um pretty much you know horrified volunteers at the the aid stations just absolutely like you know just just a mess like just come coming apart like uh, physiologically um and across the finish line and my wife is a dietitian kind of just saw my face was like oh my god you need to get an IV um and I got an IV and felt fine um so um obviously nutrition was an issue on that day. So, <clears throat> so after that one, I was like, okay, like I kind of knew I did the work. I knew like physically I could cover the distance, but there's a whole other aspect to Ironman outside of swim, bike, run. And um, swim, bike, run is at the bottom of a list of the things you need to do to get ready for an Ironman. <clears throat> That's what I realized uh, after. So what's at the top of the list? What's that? What's at the top of the list? Oh, um, sleep. Sleep. Okay. Okay. So, like, my I always tell, I always have my top ten list. Um, sleep is the most important important workout of your day. Um, what you eat for your meals is the second most important thing. Um, that day, um, your fueling for that particular workout, or I'm sorry, fueling during your workouts is the next kind of important thing. Um. And again, a lot of times people think they need the fuel for that particular workout, nothing to do with that. You're fueling for the next day. Um, and so you're always kind of prepping your body for the next day. And then you have all the little things where you're just doing body work and strength, uh, making sure that your body is kind of loose and limber, um, you know, paying attention to injuries. Um, so, and then once those are all in place, then you can swim properly, run properly, and cycle properly um but if those things aren't in place you know because that's the thing like everyone swim bikes run and trains to get to the start line so everyone's there they pretty much have done the same thing but it's your ability to do all the other things um that people aren't paying attention to better that allows you to perform uh, more to uh, your expectations and or just expectations that you didn't think were possible yeah, it's a, a great way to look at it because those all of those things that you mentioned is on the top, you know, your top yeah. 10 are all the things that athletes skip, right? Yep. Mostly enough. Yeah. <laughs> they don't eat right. 
you know, I mean, not all athletes, obviously, but it's the ones that people are like, okay, I got my swim and I got my bike and I got my running, but I didn't do anything else that was right today, you know, so. And that's unfortunate just because it's the way we were almost like brought up in athletics where it's just like no pain, no gain. And, you know, pain is weakness leaving your body. And it's like all these like ways in which you're supposed to approach sports. And then all of a sudden, like for me, just being on the other side of of being really good at a sport and nothing to do with any of that. You know, it was all just doing the things that were super easy to do, but you know, instead, you know, in order to work hard, you need to learn how to work not hard. Um, you know, so that's the thing. It's just, uh, that's what's a hard thing sometimes with coaching is trying to get rid of the way we are wired, um, you know, as a culture and how we approach sport and that, you know, the people that are really good at it actually are doing all the other things that we're not kind of paying attention to as like a general population of athletes. Yeah. It was funny back in the day, I used to race bikes and I wanted to try to go pro, but I was working as an attorney full-time while I was doing this. And my coach said to me, he said, what you need is more time to recover. That was his answer. It wasn't, you need to train harder. It's you need more time to recover, right? It's like, you're never going to be great unless you have that time and you don't have that time. So, you know, as a combination sort of thing, like you have to figure out how to find it, but yeah, all right. So 2008, first Ironman, you yep. knew you could do the distance. You knew you made mistakes yep. though, at least in getting ready. So is that the timing of when you reached out to QT2? Yep. After, okay. So why, why QT2? Why did you decide to contact QT2? Um, It was just their results in local races were just impressive. Um, there was something different about the way that they were approaching the race and where they actually started to like pull away from the competition. So it was, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't great, you know, in, in general, they weren't great swimmers. They weren't the best cyclists, but something, something was happening on the run. Um, and that was just intriguing to me. Um, and once you start to get into QT2, it really has nothing to do with how much running you're doing. It's all about the bike. Um, and not that you have to bike hard and fast, but it's just being consistent with the bike. And that was just a huge thing that I started to realize, like what is going on with the second half of the run with people on QT2? Cause it was obvious that something was, was up. Okay. So, yeah. So you reached out to QT2 and, and you got started. How? Yeah. I drove drove down to Brockton uh, some afternoon and I went to Tim Snow's basement and jumped on a computrator and got a lactic threshold test. And uh, so I got my zones uh z1 z2 z3 i don't even know if we had i don't even know if they had z3 then i think it was just like z1 and z2 and then best effort um and zr those are my zones and then i got um i don't know if it was email or actually in the mail but it was a a 12 week uh, training plan for pumpkin man triathlon which was a triathlon in my local community um it was i think the first year of that and i was going to do a half iron man in my local community based off of this piece of paper that told me what to do every single day. Um, and I executed that and I uh, felt great. And I ran really well in the second half of the run. And I knew something was up with just that approach uh, and paying attention to what they told me to do and not necessarily did what I want to do. Um, and again, it's just kind of like that science brain of mine where it's like, all right, I'm going to try this and try to prove it wrong or right just by doing it. And I did it and I got that idea. So it kind of clicked for me that, um, there is no, there was no, um, kind of, um, cap on my potential at an aerobic level. And I wanted to max that out. And so I was hooked, um, right then and there. So that would, yeah, that would have been like, Oh, nine. And I was kind of hooked. Yeah. All right. So you said your last Ironman was 2014. So 
All right. So how did you talk to me about how you basically dropped four hours off your, your Ironman time? Yeah. So I did uh, two Ironmans a year, but I would go through three Ironman preps. Um, so living in the Northeast, I would um, do a uh, Placid and then Florida. Um, but I would usually prep for a marathon kind of in February, March, so I could get another cycle in. And so, uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I just cycled uh, through three Ironman preps a year. Um, and, um, you know, just really paid attention to all like, those little things that are just super important. Um, and I just learned a lot on the forums of QT2, a lot of discussion with the coaches and just, um, you know, just started to really execute a lot of the philosophies outside of swim, bike and run. And um, because I just felt it, it was making a difference. Um, I was staying healthy. I really made my easy days easy and my hard days hard. And um, my performance just progressively went up and up and up. Mm -hmm. And were you also, did you do the nutrition piece of it as well? Yeah, I mean, luckily, also, my wife is a dietitian. She actually worked with the core diet um, way back in the day as well. Um, so I was around kind of uh, some guardrails of, um, you know, how to approach athletics, but also life. So that was, um, that was great to be exposed to that or be around that. Mm -hmm. So tell me about Tell me about, I'm going to go to that last race. Tell, tell me about that race. Which race was it? <laughs> the last race, um, so the last race yeah. was, um, beach to battleship, um, back in, Wil in Wilmington. And up to that point, I just, um, I had a great three months. I was just, um, you know, just feeling just great. Um, and like, I kind of sometimes allude to like, I didn't win anything until I was in my late thirties and I kind of won a lot of my stuff in the last three months, um, of kind of racing and, um, going into the race. Um, I mean, years ago I'd gotten my pro card at Placid. I had a good Placid race, but this particular race, I just knew I kind of felt a life change in terms of just my body was starting to kind of understand that you can't keep doing this and um and so I kind of yeah I just internally felt it and there was some stuff happening family wise where I was going to have to devote a lot more time to family and I kind of knew this was going to be the shift where I had a great run where I was just you know 30 hours a week of training 20 hours a week 10 hours a week it didn't really matter I was able to kind of balance it with everything else and I knew that balance was coming undone and so um, going into it, I was kind of like, yeah, this is my last one. And, um, and then I, I realized also like that I knew who was going to be at the race and I knew I just had to wait and do everything right. And, um, I would win. And at mile 16, I passed that final person that I almost kind of knew, you know, just by doing research and understanding how they approach races and, and where they kind of would come unglued that, um, yeah, it, it happened. It kind of, all of a sudden I was in front of an Ironman race and it was just the coolest moment ever. And, um, and so the last six, 10 miles was, um, uh, just really, really cool. Um, something that I'd worked all my life for. I didn't really realize it. Um, and then crossed the finish line and I knew it was over and that was a cool feeling too. <laughs> that was really neat. So you knew going in, it was going to yeah. be, and yeah. you did it and it was your last one. I mean, you, did yeah. you ever, did you ever change your mind or think maybe that wasn't the right decision? Oh, you, no, you, I, you I, I, thought, I, I was like, I never have to do that again. Um, it was just a perfect kind of couple months of just really just it all being amazing and fun. And um, I just, and it's kind of like the story of my life too. It's like, I go through these phases where I'm just all in on something and then I do it. And then all of a sudden it's like gone. Um, I could tell you, I could tell you some crazy things that I've done that, 
you know, it's just, I mean, I, I had my own surfboard company at one point making surfboards and like <laughs> surfing all over the place. Um, that was a moment in my life. And uh -huh. now I hold my breath for long periods of time underwater and look at fish. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just like, completely obsessed with that. Like I uh -huh. go to the pool and I'm like, what, what are you training for? I'm like, oh, I'm just training, you know, to go underwater for long periods of time, <laughs> you know? So it's just... <laughs> So I kind of had that Iron Man window and um, it was, uh, it was over and it was, it was a lot of fun and it was cool. And now that I'm coaching, it's still kind of part of me, which is still awesome. Um, but yeah, that competitive piece um, is gone. So. I mean, but what a perfect story that you knew, you knew you had the ability to do something. You started appreciating that to do that you have to put in the time and be consistent yeah and I knew you, I knew I had the ability when I was 13 I just didn't realize I was going to reach that ability when I was 38 yeah yeah so you didn't have to so life isn't set that you have to uh turn graduate college mow the lawn and put on 50 right, right. Pounds the next right. Life, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah 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 and and now it's having that huge chunk of fitness for so long, you know, now I'm 48 and, um, you know, I always tell, I always tell people like, I want my eyes and my brain to see as much as this, of this world as possible. And I can only do so if I'm like really physically fit and the benefits of being that type of athlete and putting that consistency in just, I'm reap, I'm still reaping rewards today. Like I, I do some really cool things. I travel to really cool places and I can only get into these little nooks and crannies of the world because of, you know, having some fitness. Um, and so now I kind of see the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the final hole of, you know, being in a final round of being like an Ironman athlete and I'm still reaping those awards and that, and that's fun too. So I want to get into you as a coach, but yeah, yeah. we touched, but not quite yet. We, we touched on that you are a scientist, that you're yep. a teacher. So while you were doing all, all this training, you're also, I mean, working full yep. time, right? As a teacher. So um, I know you told me offline, so now I have to ask you online. <laughs> what kind of, um, what do you teach? Yeah, I teach high school uh, biology and anatomy and physiology. Okay. And you've been teaching for how how long now? Um, just about to finish my twenty third year. Okay. And still excited? Yeah, <laughs> I love like I love it now. Now that you kind of, you know, it's I have the playbook. I I know all the plays. I know like Tom Brady says, like you know, being a quarterback now is easy. He knows all the defenses. Um, you know, not that every person is the same, but there's similarities between humans. Um, and I go into a classroom and I can just look at a kid and talk to a kid and instantaneously know kind of how to work things out. And that doesn't always happen. And it doesn't always happen perfectly. Um, but um, it, it's just nice to have an understanding of where everything is going to go and how it's going to play out. And all of a sudden kids and adults realize that about me and that just calms everything and, and builds confidence in them, even though they shouldn't necessarily have that confidence yet, but it, it's really important um, to have those connections of like, I got your back no matter what. Um, and um, that's important. And I, w I wasn't able to establish that early on and now I am. And so that's, that's fun to kind of um, reap, reap those benefits of, of being in that spot of, um, kind of being a master of your craft and people knowing it and knowing that when they walk in your room, you're going to get the best. And um, that gets rid of a lot of issues. Yeah. I mean, students and parents put a lot of trust in teachers and they don't always get what they want back out of it, but it sounds right. like you have a lot of yeah. passion for yeah. getting yeah. to know Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it shows and it, and everyone gets it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. It's very purposeful. Um, and um, like I, I kind of said earlier, it's the summertime is the roughest time of the year for me because I'm not, you know, feeling that 
uh, purposefulness in my life. Um, and so I always love getting back to school. <laughs> That's exciting. That's like, I mean, I don't know if it's the same thing, but I would say that the day I'm still kind of tootling around with my, my racing, I say that the day I stop getting excited about racing is the day that I should stop racing, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You, yeah. So coaching then, you got to sort of bring everything together, right? So I think you said you start coaching for QT2 2014, 2015. So after your last... Your last yeah, race? it was yeah. It, I I was tinkering with it, I think, um, but kind of went full time, all in, you know, after I stopped racing. But I think I had a handful of athletes that I was kind of uh, overlooking being tutored um, while I coached. Um, so I was starting to transition at that point, and then, but then, yeah, once I stopped racing, I I really started coaching full time, and yeah, that just brought my whole world together and focused it on in one spot. And that was, that was pretty cool. I could just pull through. So pull from so many aspects of my life, my history, um, and, uh, just help people reach their goals. And that's very fulfilling too. Helping people know their goals first, right? Well, that helping yeah. them discover within themselves. I mean, what their goals are. Right. And then, yeah. And their goals might not be realistic based on their athletic history. And yeah. but again, so you they, change, they have to change their history, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's the only thing you can control is yeah. you know, changing your history, yeah. not your history. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, is there a, a specific kind of athlete that you, that you work with? Um, I think the athlete that wants to understand, um, wants communication back and forth. Um, that's the type of uh, curious, tell me more why those questions, um, is, or are, are the type of people I connect with. Um, so yeah. Okay. And, um, do you have, do you have a specific coaching philosophy or approach? it's done with you not to you um so that's just an important piece to how i function uh i want to be part of it um i just don't want to tell you what to do you do it um and not have any sort of kind of connection uh, via communication about you know what or why so i would say i would say that that would be it in the you know i want to be a part of it and mm -hmm. And do you see, I mean, when you were talking about in teaching, you talk about students having different, different needs and different ways that you teach students based on that. Do you find that that's also the case in coaching? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, without a doubt, you know, the, the, the hardest part about coaching is the, the psychology of it, um, you know, to 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 do what we do is different and there's different reasons why we do it there's different reasons why we need to feel the way we feel when we're exercising um you know to be very uh, consistent and driven is a unique wiring and sometimes it's not understood by just kind of the general like i felt very ostracized because of what I did at work, you know, I'd walk into, you know, the teacher's room with a certain type of food. I had a certain look to me and it was very different than everyone else. And mm -hmm. just like in class, if a student is going to receive a high school diploma and they're the first person in their family that will ever has ever gotten a high school diploma. They are different than the people that love them. That's a, a that's a weird kind of feeling to understand. Like, why wouldn't you? But that makes you different than everyone else. And really, like being an athlete at our age is sometimes makes us very different because we're going to bed at different times. We're treating our bodies in certain ways. Oh, you know, you're having a light beer and not a craft beer. Or like, so it's like these little things that happen over and over and over again. It's kind of like it's kind of a weird world. And so to navigate that with athletes is, is important. And to kind of understand that, you know, to really 
go after goals is a unique psychological type of, um, of wiring that you need to pay attention to. So in, in the classroom setting, you have this day-to-day -day contact with students and you can figure it out with your athletes. How do you figure out what type of person they are, or what drives them? Um, you know, asking, um, it is hard. I would say the, I would love just to, you know, be somewhere and, you know, run a swim practice with all my athletes and look at them and see things. Cause, uh, you know, we communicate a lot with nonverbals. Um, so, you know, sometimes you can just look in somebody's eyes, you're like, wow, something's off. They're off. And it's really hard sometimes to get to that. And, um, and so I think my experience with that and understanding like nonverbal cues, I really try to get that through communication in a virtual way. Um, so it's just really asking questions like, you know, just not how are you doing, but you know, what was your sleep like last night? Um, those crazy questions like, all right, what, what color was your urine this morning? Like that yeah. tells me a lot of information about what's going on. Um, you know, and just kind of, you know, how are you doing? And not just how are you doing, but really how are you doing? Um, so just those next level questions sometimes just unravels things that really help you plan training. Yeah. And do you feel like you're, like when you ask the question, do you feel like you get responses from your athletes? Some yes, some no. <laughs> no, because it, it, it just depends on why the person does what they're doing. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there's, you know, sometimes there could be some sort of, if I tell my coach too much, they're going to, they're going to make my run four miles instead of eight miles. And that means I didn't check a box that, you know, was in training peaks, you know, maybe two weeks ago, but all of a sudden we need to adjust that day based off of today. And I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to divulge that information. Um, you know, so, and that's, you know, unfortunately that's when things go, go astray on a, in a season is when sometimes you are reactive as a pro, as opposed to proactive. So no, I, not all the time I get what I need. Yeah. <laughs> That would, that would be kind of boring if you did, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I mean, people want a training plan and I give them their training plan the first day of training and I send it to them. I'm like, Hey, by the way, we're not going to accomplish any of this. <laughs> uh, it might be much better. It might be about the same, or it's going to be, uh -huh. you know, we need to salvage the season. Um, yeah. so, and again, if you just pay attention to every single day, um, you'll, you'll get the right training plan for those, those months. Um, but, uh, but yeah. 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 Well, that's the beauty of one-on-one -on -one coaching though, right? Is that exactly. yeah. everything it's like, all right, here's the plan. And then here's what we're actually going to do based on what, you know, what you right. see. Right. 100%. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So what would you say is your biggest coaching challenge? Um, I think my, the, the biggest challenge gets into the whole virtual aspect of, of coaching. Um, you know, again, being a teacher, being around kids in person, there's just some other level to um, really understanding what's going on and why. Um, and so that's what is the biggest challenge. It's just really trying to take the virtual type of world and just make it more real. Um, and really just understanding that like some, some people will just do workouts and let the data tell me what's going on. And all I need are certain pronouns or verbs that trigger how it actually felt or went. And so that's the biggest challenge is just really trying to get people not to overshare, but just share enough and use some vocabulary to actually really enhance the data from a workout that's the biggest challenge yeah to put context behind the numbers yeah yeah i mean i can paint the picture but i mean the amount of colors is all going to be based on what you say and how you say it mm -hmm. yeah for sure so i think that earlier um you were saying that this being the psychologist is part of of coaching so as part of that you know as a coach we listen to 
what our athletes have to say. And, and a lot of times it's, uh, I don't know if I can do this or I'm not sure about. So when you get those kind of questions, those questions where an athlete is doubting their ability to do something, how do you respond? I mean, most likely they're doubting themselves because they're comparing themselves to somebody else. Um, and so if you are able to really focus the athlete into their bubble, uh, they can do anything that they can do. It's just, you know, with the social media and exposure to the highlight reel of people's lives, um, it's just understanding that, you know, really the only thing you can control is the next 24 hours in yourself. Um, you can't control your past. You can't control your future. And again, you start to worry about the past, you get um, depressed, you start worrying about the future, you get anxious, but really, right. I mean, right now you want like, I'm, everything's cool right now, you know, mm -hmm. and right in this moment. And um, so it's just really trying to get them to think about themselves and not ultimately compare themselves to somebody else. Because again, when you look at something and compare yourself to competitors or people locally that you want to beat, it's the athletic history. And people don't realize like, wow, that kid, I didn't realize that kid, their parents made them go to swim practice from when they were six years old till they were 13. And then they hated swimming and then they did something else. So like from six to 13, this kid, swam all the time and all of a sudden i'm trying to beat them in the 45 to you know 46 to 50 age group and they keep on beating me in the water and i don't understand why it's like well <laughs> they were going back and forth in a pool for seven years yeah. and and they, it's all wired like they're wired completely different than you and it wasn't anything that they thought they were going to do but yeah they're going to beat you every single time in the swim so just <laughs> or, you know let's just think about something else like there's no way to do it um, it's impossible. Um, so, so again, it's just really trying to think about that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we tell the story that we want to hear in the moment, but there's, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah. I mean, you can't control how fast that other kid is swimming. <laughs> you can only control what, what you're doing. Totally. Yeah. So, um, and so all this time now, I mean, you've been coaching for close to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah what would, what are some of your coaching success stories? People are still with me. Um, people I've had for you know, almost 10 years. Um, so that, that's been cool uh, to be connected to people in their lives, um, to know about people that they love and are part of their lives. And to sometimes just text them, be like, hey, how is so-and-so doing, you know, your your brother or your partner or something. Um, so to still feel that desire to know and, and care, that's been the best part is the just the connections that I've had with humans that I would have, have otherwise connected with. Wow. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna end it on that note because I <laughs> I love everything about what you just said. <laughs> so thank you so much, Vinny. Oh, I really appreciate right. you taking the time. Awesome. Thank you.